All right, welcome to a very special Sports Injury Central Pro Football Doc podcast. Special guest time, and yes, I know, Pro Football Doc, but it's basketball time. It's March Madness time, and I love the off-season podcast because we can bring on guests. We've got lots of extra time. And look, March Madness is bigger than the Super Bowl when you really get down to it, so who better to bring in is college basketball insider analyst knows everything college basketball jeff goodman welcome to the show no thanks for having me david listen we followed each other for a long time i wanted to do this last year and i think all hell broke loose i think we had something <laughs> set up and you know the only difference this year from like last year it, it's a little different where coaches get fired earlier now because the transfer portal open today so coaches ad's have to do their firings earlier so they can do their hirings earlier so they don't miss out all these kids that go in the portal so they're not far behind so everything kind of moved up a little bit so this year the portal's already got like 200 guys in it and we're at we're, we're recording this thing at like 1 30 eastern time it's going to be a record setting day uh with the amount of players going in the transfer portal and it's just a dumb decision by the ncaa dave to open the portal the day after selection Sunday. We should be talking all about the tournament, and instead I'm tweeting out about these mid-major players that are going in the transfer portal. Stupid. Really bad. <laughs> so the NC2A actually made that decision to do that? They picked that, yeah. or they were forced to? or No, they picked it. They picked it, but they don't understand the consequences. And, <laughs> and it's like, I get it. They want to open it up now because they want the window to be larger for these kids to be able to make a decision. But the other problem with it is, you know, these teams that are that are preparing for NCAA tournament games, the coaches should be preparing and spending all their time on that. Instead, they're literally doing like Zooms with players an hour before their tournament games. Guys in the portal, it, it makes no sense. It's not logical. Okay, so that's like NFL free agency at the start of the playoffs. Right, right. right. I mean, it would make yes. no sense, right? None, zero, you, zero. And, and – I can't believe that they chose this. This is like makes zero sense whatsoever. Zero. Attention off of your number one thing, which is look, right, right. I look at it this way. I don't think the NC2A would even exist anymore without March Madness. Agreed. Because that's their revenue yes. stream is it's March Madness. Yep. That's really all that football's yep. got. That's all they have. Right. Their 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 licensing, their the regulatory capacity is all gone. Yeah. All they have is March Madness, and they're messing with the golden goose. The, the, the goose I've tweeted the golden twenty five times today so far, and I bet you twenty three of them have been about kids going in the portal. Like, why would you want me doing that? You forced me to do it because it's the news coming out right now. Instead of tweeting about the NCAA, it just it's so short sighted. How many of uh, let's say there's 300 people in the portal. How many will be signed before the first Thursday, March Madness? Game? None of them. I mean, what some of them are done behind the scenes, right? Okay. Some go in the portal and they have agents and it's already done. They're committed. But like publicly, very few. Most of them, they're putting their name in the portal to see, number one, if they can get a better situation. And oftentimes that better situation will include NIL now. Like that's the first thing, even for the low major kids, who put up 15, 12, 17 points a game, the first question when they do a Zoom now with the, with, with the coaches is, hey, coach, how much? What are you going to get me NIL-wise? That's what it is. No, 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 no question about it. But another thing that I, I'm just observing here, you would yeah. know, is this the death knell for the NIT? Oh, yeah. The, the NIT sucks now. They, they changed <laughs> it this year to whereas – you know, in the past, it was if you win your regular season tournament, you're in. So the little guy knew, hey, even if, um, you know, even if I don't, if I win my regular season title, but I don't win the, the tournament, at least I get uh, an, an NIT bid. That is no longer because they realized they thought they had this figured out where they would have more high major teams in, make more money off it because they would have the, the gate, right? The gate at, you know, Indiana. Memphis, places like that. Well, what they didn't take into account was because of the portal opening early, these coaches are saying to themselves, I don't want to play in the NIT. Number one, I might not have my team. 
they might all go in the portal. Number two, I want to get a head start on the portal. I don't want to be dealing with playing an NIT game and not being able to get, uh, you know, get in the portal, talk to kids, uh, have an advantage over those teams that are in the NCAA tournament that maybe don't have the same level of time. And on top of that, even if you did do all that, a kid that is going to transfer, it's like you got to be worried about injuries. What does that, that do too. for your transfer that possibility, too. right? Yes. This is an injury podcast. This is like, yeah. you know, NFL players sitting or, or you know, look. Well, college I, we, football we guys with bowl games, right? College football guys with the NIT guaranteed, yes. Like, for instance, kid at Indiana, Khalil Ware. He's probably going to be a first-round pick. Well, if Indiana decides to play in the NIT, why would Khalil Ware play in, in the NIT? Like he'll 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 opt out like these kids do out of the bowl games. Yeah, no, no, no question about it. And uh, you know, and teams do it too. Like, you know, you sit Russell Wilson at the end of the year because you don't want him to get injured because of the guarantees. You sat Jimmy Garoppolo or the Raiders because the injuries come into this too. So I this I see this as the death knell for the NIT, you know, in terms of what's happening. Cause if the stars and play, you don't know who you can field, and teams don't even accept bids, and and they're done. I think uh, that's that's uh, that's too bad there. All right, so selection Sunday just happened. Um, give us some of your big takeaways, whether injury related yeah. or not, and we can get into some injury issues. Yes, and, and, yes. Uh, and and I always I say know. this. I always yeah. say this during the football season. We have so much to say, and there's so yeah. much injury information. But I tell my guys it's signal to noise. We have high signal, but there is a lot of noise out there. Right now, our you know injuries in basketball not as much. The signal is high, but the noise is less. And really, we're in a position, and I hope we can maybe give you some insight in in your followers. I think this is accurate. Would you agree, Jeff? We're the only site that gives true injury analysis. That's everyone why I reach else, out to you. Yes. Everyone else is injury reporting. And so the coach said, and that's all you get, right? right and right. the coaches often don't say much of anything either, especially in college. And so we try and do injury analysis, same with the NFL. So so give us your biggest takeaways, and maybe I'll let you drive the bus and ask your questions about injuries because you're better at doing that than me running a podcast. <laughs> so. No, I'm I'm listening. I'm, I'm really interested to hear a couple things. So Kansas is the big one, Dave. They're the big one because they've got two of the best probably 15 players in the country. Okay, Hunter Dickinson and Kevin McCullough. They're not a deep team. They really play four main guys, those two who are all Americans. Then they got a kid, Dewan Harris, who's a point guard. And then they got one more kid, Johnny Furphy, who's a freshman from Australia, who's come on you know pretty well the second half of the year. Well, Hunter Dickinson, well, let's start with McCullough because I think that one you, it will be a little easier for you to evaluate. He's had a bone bruise in his knee for a while now. I mean, I think he's been dealing with it, he said, since the first time, the last time he played Cincinnati, which was uh, three, four weeks ago. He's played, he's sat, he's played again, he sat in the Big 12 tournament uh, this past week. What's your take on, on, a, on a, obviously it's a significant bone bruise because this is a tough kid. This is not your typical kid who's just going to bail out. Like, he's on the highest level of tough kids in college basketball. How much do you think this affects Kevin McCuller? He's going to play. He told me he's going to play. Well, look, it's the it's March Madness. They're going to play, right? Yes. And, yes. and it does seem like the team and the player have been resting him to play in the tournament. That's so right. he's going to play. But the first thing I'd say to you, Jeff, is to the lay public and your followers, a bone bruise, suck it up, buttercup. No, 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 no. <laughs> Look, this bone bruise that we're dealing with is a bruise of the ends of the bone being jammed together. It's not, I got a Charlie horse, I got hit on the leg or the knee, or I ran into something and it hurts and no big deal. It's a bone bruise that's deep underneath the bone. And if you think about it this way, Articular cartilage in your knee is what's most valuable. It's the articular cartilage ends got jammed together and the bone underneath was injured. And I'm not, you know, I don't like using big medical words and I can do that, but here's my simple analogy. Yep. If you think of grass on a football field or a golf course or soccer field as the articular cartilage, that's the grass. The dirt underneath is the bone. When yep. you get a bone bruise, 
it's like an elephant stomped on the grass and the dirt underneath, the bone underneath is injured. You could make a case to say it's a microscopic fracture and there's edema underneath in the bone bruise. The big worry is if you continue to play football on that grass that got the elephant stomping on it, will the grass die out? Will the articular cartilage die out? So it's a microscopic fracture underneath the bone, and there is okay. potential long-term worry. So I'm just saying this kid is being heroic and wanting to try and play through this. This yeah. is not a suck-it-up pain tolerance injury or issue. And this is why it's real, and especially the type of dynamic player that he is. Yeah. And it's going to affect him. Our six score on him, and as you know, and for some of your things, nobody's really at a hundred, right? Hundred is you got zero, Gosh. but you know, nineties is pretty good. Like he's kind of low eighties right now, and a six score of eighty-one. In other words, he's not as dynamic as he normally is. Now nope. he he's a two-way player, right? And he's a pretty good defender. Very good. He he kind of has to pick which one he's going to concentrate on. You know, I would guess he'd pick the offensive side because he kind most, of carries most team. kids do david yeah, yeah most I kids do <laughs> i know so what happens to his defense and is to his team so at bet i think he's going to play but yep. he's in the yellow category he's not yep. red for us he's not green he uh, uh, besides a little bit of rust and and what have you um besides a little bit of rust and what have you i don't think he can be as dynamic and it's real it's real and then, uh, so that's kind of where we are with with him. But yeah, I agree with you. He's going to play. He's been setting himself up to play for this. And uh, to make it clear, I don't think he has any long-term risk right. at this point in time for yeah. his NBA career. But the question is how dynamic, and I don't see him being himself per se. All right, so the next one I think will be clearer for you because Hunter Dickinson, Kansas's big guy who transferred from Michigan this year, one of the best bigs in the country, dislocated his right shoulder about 10 days ago, 10 days ago. Uh, I got yelled at because I pulled him out of the training room after their game uh, at the Big 12 tournament. <laughs> and I've known him, so I, I just wanted to say hello and, and, and see how he was doing. Um, what do you think? Now, he's going to have about, what, four more days here. So he'll, he'll go two weeks in between uh, playing games. Dislocated shoulder. How healthy, how effective is Hunter? I, like, this is the one I'm dying to ask you because right. I want to know how how effective can we expect Hunter Dickinson to be? Oh, I want to ask that question and, and we'll have a good discussion. But I'm more yeah. curious about who yelled at you for pull. How A, how did you pull someone out of the training room? That's like off yeah. limits to reporters. Yeah. Obviously, you're big time. And who yelled at you? I'm curious about that. The, the sports information director yelled at me. And I've got a good relationship with him. But I understood how it looked. I shouldn't have done it. I shouldn't have done it. But I've known Hunter for five years. Uh, and again, it wasn't like I was. I wasn't digging for info. I really was. And I just I hadn't seen him. Uh, I just want to say kind of good luck. Hope you're healthy for the tournament. Um, but yeah, I, I, I probably overstepped my bounds. There. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's pretty funny there. So here's the deal. My assumption is it's a first time dislocation on his right sure. shoulder. He's right hand dominant. Although yep. I think he can do a little bit both hands. This is a big deal. First time dislocations take longer to return because there's more damage second and third time less damage I, I look we've done the analysis on him right now we have a six score on him of 51 Oof. which means we we'll puts him in the red which means not sure that he's going to play and even if he does play his numbers and effectiveness might be in the 50 percent range wow. okay a because the standard look I'll bet this kid tries to play, right? Because this is yeah. the Super Bowl yeah. for them. This is, you know, I hey, 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 Dave. Also, he should play because he's getting about a million dollars of NIL. So I, I think there's going to be a little pressure to play. Does it okay? But does it really work that way? I mean, NIL. Yes and no. Get, I right. mean, I think with this kid, yes. I think he feels some loyalty to give it a go, even if he's at fifty percent. I do. 
Yeah, and and I think even without the NIL, NIL money, there's loyalty to your teammates and to your team to give it right. a go. So do I do think he will try to give it a go if he at all can. Let me give you a, a comp here. Okay. Not the same player, not the same situation. Julius Randle in the NBA. Yep. Knicks. The Knicks said, oh, we expect him back, this, that, the other. And we said, not so fast here. Now, the NBA is different, guaranteed contracts. There isn't the same pressure, but it is a big deal. Look, in the NFL, it is relatively routine to return to play in two weeks from a dislocated shoulder. Now, it's, even then, it depends on the type of player. If it's a quarterback, it's a different story, dominant arm, whatever. But you play with a harness or a brace. Okay to keep the shoulder from coming out into certain positions where it might dislocate again. Very hard to do in basketball and be effective. This is why we were fading Julius Randle's return with the Knicks, and he still hasn't. Now, different motivation here. College kid, this is the big thing, the tournament. I think he's going to try, but how effective can you be? Look, the only way you assure that the shoulder doesn't come out again is you put the harness or the brace on pretty tightly, but then it affects his effectiveness in rebounding, blocking shots, shooting, defending, and the whole deal. Now, if you don't put the harness on tight, you risk redislocation again, and it's still fresh. So this is why we're relatively pessimistic. Look, I hope he proves us wrong. I've never met the kid. You obviously know the kid. You obviously yeah. like the kid. Yeah. I wish the best for the kid. I'd be thrilled that he would outperform. But I kind of want to be fair to the kid by setting the right expectations of what you can expect here, which is not a lot. Defensively, won't be the same guy. Rebounding won't be the same guy. Block shots won't be the same guy. Can he get off some shots still? I mean, he's a seven-footer. Maybe he can get off some shots still, right? Yeah. But – this is why overall we have them at a six score of 51. This is not. Dave, we're going to clip player. this. Hey, we got to clip this. Get it to me. Because when I tweet this out about Hunter Dickinson, um, this was, man, like this was insightful. This was in insightful because I think a lot of people think you can throw him out there and he'll be back to 90% when he comes back. And, and it sounds and, like and, there's no way. And And look. One of the things that I want to make sure, as, as you help me reach a new yeah. audience, is we deal at Sports Injury Central, panel of doctors. Yes, I'm the main one. I do have some basketball experience and college, as well as MBA. We deal in insider knowledge, not insider information. Right. I have right. not seen an MRI of Hunter Dixon Dickinson. I have not examined him. I don't know. We're not violating HIPAA. And yeah, I'm this is your we, best guess based on the information that you have. Obviously. Insider knowledge, yeah. Yeah. providing some analysis, yep. and this is where we're kind of at. It's a whole lot better than my information and, and my analysis, so I'll take it. I'll take it. And And, and this is similar – since you and I chatted a little bit, and thank you, on Friday, you texted me about uh, Braden Smith. Yeah. And I was in surgery. I wasn't watching the game. And, right. and I'm the first to admit that I have not watched as much college basketball this season. Sure. I got 11-11 and 6 at home, okay? I mean, I spent all <laughs> my my sports-watching chips yeah. on the NFL. Yeah, I you take Sundays. Every, no, no, your Sundays, oh, your wait. wife knows, right? Wait, your wait, wife wait, knows. Wait, 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 wait. Right? I get so much grief from wife. Not Sundays. Okay. Sundays and Sunday evening. Monday night, Thursday. Thursday. Yeah. And all those Saturday games. <laughs> well, you know what it is? Hey, you know what it is in college time. basketball? You know what it is in college basketball? All the time, every day. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Occasionally, you get a Friday night where there aren't games. Saturday loaded all day. Sunday. And, and it's day crazy. and night, right? I mean, right. it's crazy. Yes. So, so yes. I can't follow it all, and I yeah. don't pretend to be an expert in it. Yeah. So we'll rely on you on that. We're just providing the injury side of it. But you text me up, Braden Smith. Yeah. I'll be the first to embarrass say, I didn't know who he was. Okay, yep. so I'm just, you know, Fair. give yeah. a spade a spade. Sure. But do the investigation. We have a great staff. You sent some video. We collected more video. Who's Braden Smith, Purdue, yep. the situation, the whole thing. And look. By the time I got to it, he had already returned to the game, right? And the yes. in-game stuff about, oh, my God, he tore his ACL maybe. 
didn't come true, right? He came back into the game. By the time I looked at it, the coach had already indicated and people already indicated it was his left calf. But we were all concerned about the right knee, right? And that's why I text you back. I'm not sure he's out of the woods on this. Now, it did turn out, obviously, he returned to the game. And there's no question he played against Wisconsin, right? But when I was texting you back and we looked at it, I said, that did not look like an ACL tear, which is good. But that did look like a bone bruise, a bone bruise that we just talked about on McCullers, okay? Right. And sometimes those swell. And it was a possibility that Braden Smith wouldn't be able to play. He played against Wisconsin, but we knew he couldn't really be that effective. Not only because the left calf was pre-existing, he came into the game with a sleeve. Now he's got a right knee bone bruise, maybe mild, and there's different degrees of bone bruise. Yep. Didn't see him being effective and dynamic. And what happened in the Purdue-Wisconsin uh, game? Obviously, overtime and loss, but let's look specifically at it. He scored seven points in the first half. Not his typical average. None in the second half. Half of it. In the first half, the guy's a good player. He can manufacture some points, yeah. but then Wisconsin figures out how to defend him. He's not as dynamic. Rebounds. Three rebounds. I mean, that's not as typical because he's not getting inside. He's not as dynamic. Ten assists. More than his average. Why? Because he's looking to dish. Because he, he can't drive and do everything else. And he also had more turnovers than typical because he's looking to dish. And he also had five fouls. F foul trouble, which yeah. he almost is never in. Which never. means it's hard for him to move his feet because of his knee and calf. The opponent had 22 points on him, who normally averages 10, the Wisconsin guard. Yep. Four fouls early in the game. And then the final key drive, a charge that created the turnover when he fouled out and Wisconsin won. That's what we mean by injury analysis, looking at it. Not as and effective. We're not, yeah, not yeah. as effective. And, yeah. and is McCullers going to be this exact same situation? We hope not. He's not as fresh off the bone bruise, which, you know, Braden Smith, we had his six score like at 60, okay? Yeah. And if you look at his production, what he did, that's about right. He did play. Yeah. Now, we have McCullers at 81, so we're a little more optimistic. But you get kind of what we do with this. All right, let me give you one more. Okay. Uh, the one more would be, and this is a big one, Tyler Kolick, Marquette, point guard, who's been out for about three weeks with an oblique injury. Mm -hmm. um, awesome point guard. Awesome. I mean, just maybe the best overall point guard in the country. You know, runs the show, makes people better, picks his spots. Little guy, uh, not not a big dude, and he got hurt on it twisting as he threw a pass about, I think we're going back now, almost two, two change, maybe about two weeks ago that he's been off. So he'll get about three full weeks. Uh, again, tough as nails. Would have probably played in the Big East tournament if they let him. But I think Shaka Smart and Marquette were very smart. And they said, there's no way in hell we are letting you play because ultimately we need you for the NCAA tournament as healthy as we can get you. Well, I'm glad you bring him up too because you got to at least give me one that I'm optimistic on okay. as opposed okay. to being negative Nancy yeah. with everybody yeah. and injury, doom, and gloom. We try and call it as it is here. Oblique injury, muscle injury, does heal on its own. Three weeks is not a bad timeline to get into the 85, 90% healthy range. Okay. Yeah. And how often do you really do throw that baseball pass and, and, right. and re injure it? Look, do I think Tyler Kolick's 100%? No. Is he going to play? Of course he is. They're yeah. positioning him to play. How effective? I'd say high, mid high 80s. Good. And the only reason not 90s is because of rust. Right? right, because right. he's had some time off. It's not really related to the injury itself. It's more the associated rust. So relative optimism, except for the rust on Tyler Kolick, do not expect aggravation to right. it. Relative optimism for the Marquette guard. All right, good to hear. Those are the ones I had to run through with you. Uh, <laughs> I got about 10 minutes. If you want to ask me any 
Are there any tournament questions you want to hit me with? All right. Uh, okay, I'm going to ask you a Homer okay. question. Okay? All right, go ahead. Uh, San Diego State, okay? Yep. Love Fisher, Dutcher. Yep. It's the only college basketball I've really seen this year. Obviously, okay. Jaden Ledee and the thing. Yep. And, yes, I brought my – I was a bandwagon guy. I brought my son to Houston last year <laughs> to go to the game. San Diego State, what do you think about them? And their matchup um, UAB and wow. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think they got a good first round matchup. I mean, I do. UAB obviously had a very mediocre season this year and turned it on, you know, and really the 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 tournament, the AAC tournament was opened up because Florida Atlantic lost. Memphis wasn't very good. You know, South Florida won the regular season. They were just okay. So you could kind of see anybody maybe coming out of that league. You thought it was FAU. Um I, I like Obviously, Ladie's been awesome this year. He's taken a jump that you see very few players take at that point in his career. You know, basically a role player, you know, for, for you know, first part of his college career at the same place. And then all of a sudden, he makes a huge jump and is one of the probably the best 10, 15 players in the country. I just don't know if they have enough uh, behind him, you know, in terms of scoring. The other thing is they don't have any rim protection this year. Last year, they had Nathan Mensa who is big, veteran, block shots, protect the rim, finish around the basket, catch lobs. They don't have that. I saw them play probably three weeks ago in person out in uh, in Logan, Utah, against Utah State. And, and again, Ladies, everything is advertised. He's that good. I just don't think they have enough. Like Lamont Butler, who made the big shot last year, obviously, to send them into the, the championship game against uh, FAU, he just hasn't. He hasn't taken that jump that he needed to take offensively. Gotcha. So uh, not getting to the Final Four, a sweet 16 would be a very successful season. Oh, yeah. Are you kidding? Yeah. Absolutely. That would be – Maybe favored in round one. If they can prevail round two, it should be celebration all around and and see what happens. Yeah, I think so. In round two, listen, Auburn, you can beat Auburn. Auburn's not overwhelming now. They just won the SEC tournament, but it's not like they've got big – Bruce Pearl loves small guards, and these guards can't really break guys down off the bounce. So I actually think San Diego State's second-round matchup is very advantageous. I, I don't – maybe Yale could knock off Auburn. It wouldn't <laughs> shock shock me. It would surprise me. Uh, but I, well, I think San Diego State can win two games again. Well, look, I'll root for Yale. Okay. Before we started, I, 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 we talked about you're from Boston. You don't have yeah. a Boston accent. The reason why I could do my park your car in Harvard Yard and went to a potty and had some pizza is I went to school in Boston. I went to Harvard. And when you go to an Ivy League school, you have to claim the entire league. Because, <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, Wait, even Dartmouth? Even Dartmouth right now? Uh, I, I got to claim them all. We got to claim all what right. they have. Okay. Right. So in the NFL, you have this, you know, oh, I went to Michigan. I went to Notre Dame. I went to Ohio State. Yeah. Like anyone who went to an Ivy League school, we claim. Marcellus Wiley, still a good friend, went to Columbia. Love I got to claim, every, I, I claim everyone who went to the Ivy. So I'm claiming Yale right now. Even Yale is. Can I give you my Marcellus Ivy. story? Can I give yeah, you my Marcellus do. Wiley do. story? Yeah, I'll cut it do. down quickly. No, I was no, a I young reporter. I, this, this is good stuff here. I, yeah. Because. I, I, look, I'll go on his podcast or his show again. I think tomorrow. I, I, I want tell him. I want a good. So story. you got to tell him this story. This is caught. Okay. He, I don't know if he'll remember me. I was a young reporter covering the Buffalo Bills for the Associated Press in in Buffalo. It was the year of Doug Flutie, Rob Johnson, um, and uh, in, in the last year of Andre Reed, Thurman Thomas, and Bruce Smith. Bruce Smith actually was awesome to me. Loved him. Now he was trying to. I think he was trying to use me a little bit and. and show me that he was injured throughout the year. So I think he knew he could kind of work me as a young reporter a little bit, uh, but I loved him. So Ted Washington had the locker next to Marcellus Wiley. Marcellus is the best dude in the world, the, in the world. I love him. Uh, Ted Washington was a pain in the ass. Anybody who would go up to him, any reporter would go up to him, and he would give him this song and dance, like, oh, well, I don't want to talk. Well, he, it would just be this big thing. Now, I work for the AP. I didn't need a nose tackle, generally, right? I didn't need a quote from him. I needed quotes from, you know, maybe Bruce, Thurman, Andre Reed, Rob Johnson, Doug Flutie, all those guys. But, like, we're at, like, week eight at this point. 
And I hadn't gone up to him. I'd been there for training camp. And uh, and finally, I said to myself, all right, like, I'm 25. Like, I'm from Boston. I got I had interviewed everybody, even to that point. I had interviewed – first interview I ever did was James Worthy when I was, like, 14 years old. So I wasn't intimidated by too many people. So I go up to Ted, and I said, hey, Ted, you know, you got a minute? And he gives me this huge – again, this thing, oh, man, I'm, I'm, I don't want to deal with – you know, and he's, he's ranting and raving about nothing. So I look over and Marcellus is, is standing right next to him. And I go, why does he have to be such an asshole? Right in front of Ted. Like Ted's right there. And uh, and and I walk out of the, the, the locker room a minute later. I'm like, hey, I don't want to deal with this dude, whatever. So I left. Well, the defensive lineman had to come through the media room to get to their film room every day. So I'm up there in the middle of the uh, – of the media room. And he, sure enough, here they come walking up, come up off the elevator. They go past. And I'm like, Oh boy, this could get ugly. Sure enough. Ted comes right up in my face. The SI, the, the PR guy is there. All the other guys are there. It comes up in my face and he's this guy he looks over at the, the PR guy, Scott Burke told his name. He goes, this guy called me an asshole yesterday. And I said, and I'm I'm fearing for my life at that point. Ted Washington's, you know, 350 pounds. He could have honestly destroyed me in, in one punch or anything. And uh, I said, well, you know, I didn't call you. An I, I said you were acting like an asshole. And uh, and luckily, Bruce Smith came up, came up and, like, I think diffused the situation a little bit. Probably saved my life uh, at that point because, again, but but – I wonder if Marcellus would remember that at all. My guess is no, it was, I don't know, 25 years ago, 25 years ago. I would bet that he does. Really? And I would say the only thing, knowing Marcellus, yeah. the only thing that prevented him from answering you or saying, I'll talk to you yeah. is that, Ted was right there and he yes. had, and, and yes. he's the young guy. He had to toe yep. the party line. That's right. Uh, what I've always said about Marcellus, uh, look, this is great chatty. I didn't even know about your Buffalo history. I guess I yeah. should do my homework. I mean, uh, like Doug Flutie, love Doug Flutie. Saw him yep. in Vegas, the Super Bowl, that was, yep. and Andre Reed, like all these yep. people, et cetera, Marcellus, et cetera. But the one thing that makes Marcellus Wiley so unique Besides this Compton to Columbia and, and oh my God, he's still doing all this charity stuff. Yeah. Forget the fact that his wife now is real housewives. And, and yeah. I went to, yeah. I went to his wedding, Anna Marie. She's awesome. Okay. Really? But what makes him different is look, what am I, I'm not trying to name drop here. I'm just giving you the comparison. Yep. Junior say I was one of my best friends. He actually officiated my wedding, et cetera. Junior say really? was, the, was the greatest guy in the wow. world. Wow. He never, ever turned down a little kid, anything, yep. anyone, anywhere. Yep. The tagline for anyone who's met Junior is like, he was the nicest guy in the world. Like he had that way within 10 seconds or five seconds of a quick encounter making you feel very comfortable. Yep. And he yep. was the greatest role model. But where, here's where Marcellus outshines Junior. Go ahead. Marcellus will engage little kids that aren't coming up to him. Like, I mean, yes. he's just a big little kid. I remember yeah. walking through, yeah. he's working at ESPN at the time, walking through ESPN Plaza, Staples yeah. Center, and he'd go up, hey, little fellow, what are you doing? And like, go in, a, like, not, yes. hey, I'm a great football player, come up to me. Oh, he what just a great enjoyed dude. life. He would go, yes. like, so my guess is he'll remember it. And, and if he ever saw you again right now, he'd say, I'm sorry I didn't come say hello to you and whatever, yeah. but I couldn't because of the constraints of the room and, and whatever, reading the room with Ted Washington's neck is to do that. He is that engaging of a person. This is why I'm not surprised yeah. at his media success in terms of what's going on. No, he was he was honestly elite to deal with. I didn't deal with him a ton, but enough. He was elite. Now, I say that to everybody now. When, when he made it on TV and did a great job, I'm like, this dude, again, I was young. I was young and I thought I knew things and obviously you don't when you're that young, but man, the way he was with me helping me out, um, I'll never forget it. You, you just don't forget those things when you're young and you're, you're, you're in and a lot of people treat you like shit and don't try to help you. 
and Marcellus did. He he just at that point, uh, it was kind of entertaining uh, that story of of Ted Washington. Got it, got it. All right, uh, Jacobs producers here and Taylor's in the room. One question for Jeff yeah. Goodman. What do you got? They're they're all over. Go God. ahead. One question. What is it? Who do you think is going to win the tournament this year? Oh, what a boring <laughs> question. Okay, I'll follow up. Who's going to win, and who's the biggest surprise that will surprise people and go far? Come on, who's going to win? So, I mean, who's going to win? I think most people are going to say UConn right now. I, I just can't go there again to defend. I, I mean, I think, honestly, they got a great shot, but I hate going with the, the popular opinion. Uh, so I'm going to I'm gonna go with somebody else here. Um, I'm going to say Purdue does, although you've got me worried about Braden Smith now. You've got me worried a little bit about him, that he's Gaff, still going to have Gaff this. injuries linger. <laughs> All right, so forget it. I'm out. I'm out. I'm going to go. Boy. Uh, I haven't filled out my whole bracket because, honestly, it's been a whirlwind. Like, since the brackets came out last night, it was like I did like five hours of shows this morning between the transfer portal. Um, boy, this is a brutal, brutal call. I think it's going to be one of the favorites. I'll go – how about this? I will go Carolina in an unbelievable story because two years ago, as we know, they came out of nowhere. They were horrible for 80% of the year. They go on a run and end up losing in the national title game. Last year, they start off preseason number one, and they were abysmal. This year, Caleb Love leaves and transfers from Carolina to Arizona. Can't get into Michigan, by the way. So he goes to Arizona. Arizona's the number two seed in the same region as them. So Carolina could have to play their former teammate, um, Caleb Love in Arizona, in the Elite Eight to get to the Final Four. But Armando Baycott, R.J. Davis were on that team both teams, and they brought in a bunch of transfers that were losing players. Harrison Ingram, Cormac Ryan. They brought in a reclassified freshman point guard named Elliot Cadeau, who's terrific because he, he pushes the pace. He makes people better. They all kind of came together as kind of losing players or players that we all kind of wrote off. And I think they've figured out, okay, you know what? Our chemistry, we're playing for the same thing. We've matured. We've put up numbers on teams that haven't won last year, and we're going to come together for the right reasons. And they have been – R.J. Davis has been a top five point guard, top five guard in the country, and you need somebody like that. You can give the ball to – there aren't many guys, Dave, that I would say, hey, you know what? I trust with a game on the line. Give him the ball. Make a play. He can score. He can also get the ball to his teammates. There are probably a handful of those guys. He's one of them. And, and that's what worries me with some, like, even, you know, Purdue now with Braden Smith and then Zach Eady being your best player. You still got to get the big boy the ball. I'd rather have somebody that I know you throw the ball in his hands and he can make a play with the ball in his hands. Got it. So who's a surprise, like a lower seed that gets to the Elite Eight or Final Four? So who's a surprise? So it's much harder to find that. Uh, the, the best second round game, and, and this, you know, FAU UConn is going to be fun because obviously FAU made that magical run last year. They had everybody back. They've been up and down. They beat uh, Arizona in Vegas, but they've had some bad losses. That's the second round matchup that I want to see uh, more than anything else. I will say this I will probably, if you gave me one team, um, that I think, and again, you got to kind of look at the brackets there and see who's who's vulnerable. I'll take BYU to make a run as a six mm. seed, and here's why: Iowa State's the two seed there. Um, they're good. They've had an unbelievable year. I don't think they're super talented. Illinois is the three seed. I don't think they have a point guard. BYU, if they catch fire shooting the ball, they can beat anybody, and they've shown that. Now, again, if they don't. They lose to anybody. They lose to Duquesne in, in round one if they shoot five for 30 from three. But the numbers are pretty good for them in terms of they shoot it more than they don't. Um, they don't – they're not overly athletic. They don't look the part. But, man, you when you trade threes for twos, the Boston Celtics do it pretty well. Um, you can beat just about anybody on any given night. And I, I looked at who they have to play, and I'm like, okay, could they beat Illinois? Sure. Could they beat Iowa State? Sure. 
Now that takes him, you know, that could take him to an elite eight appearance if they kind of run through all these teams. All right. There you go. All right. Final thing, Jeff, tell everyone where you're going to be at, how to follow you, how to see your work and everything else. So uh, Field of 68, we started the network a few years ago when I left ESPN. Um, It's our own deal, me and Rob Doster. We do pregame shows. We're the only ones who cover college basketball year-round. We're the only ones. We have a great group of people. Randolph Childress, former Wake Forest star. Tyler Hansborough, former North Carolina star. Rob Doster. Myself, John Fano, who's a rising star in in the profession. Uh, And we do them every, literally every night. Every night we're on Sirius, uh, we're on YouTube, uh, we're on Stadium, and we'll have pregame shows. I'll be out in Vegas before the games start, after the games. Make sure you follow me on uh, on Twitter, X, whatever the heck you want to call it now, at Goodman Hoops. Uh, also do a show with Di Gottlieb on Stadium as well during the day. It's normally 1 o'clock Eastern time every day, but obviously with the tournament starting up. Uh, that time will change a little bit. So, but the easiest way, and, and the breaking news generally comes on Twitter on X at Goodman Hoops. Well, that's great, and uh, that was our uh, plan B. If uh, couldn't get Jeff Goodman, we were going to get Doug Gottlieb on. So I'm glad we got you. Don't you, you don't want to do that? You would have said two words the entire uh, segment. Doug would have would have. Doug likes to talk. I love Doug, and man, even when I do the show with him, it's a 30 minute show. I think I get about three minutes in. <laughs> yeah, but that might make my job easier, right? I mean, True. I don't, know. I, I, don't I don't do this for a living. I'm a doctor, right? I'm <laughs> no, you're good at it. You're good thing. at it. I like. Listen, I'm going to watch this more. I obviously follow you on social media, but I'm going to start to watch a lot more because maybe I can. Yeah, I've had some bad years in fantasy football lately, so I need all the help I can get. <laughs> All good. All right, Jeff Goodman, uh, go follow him at Goodman Hoops. Thanks again for the time, especially at such a busy time of the year. Not only the brackets, but NIL. Really appreciate you. And uh, we'll be right back with part two of the Sports Injury Central Pro Football Doc podcast. All right, thanks again to Jeff Goodman, part two of the Pro Football Doc Sports Injury Central podcast. It was so fun chat- chatting with him, and I didn't want to say too much but one thing i forgot to say on on uh, the center for kansas uh didn't the coach we talk about coach speak all the time didn't the coach that said he looks good non-contact yeah <laughs> <laughs> yes okay but your shoulder's not going to dislocate again non-contact i guess it's a good sign that he's got range of motion back but it's just what can he do with the brace on anyways yep. no i'm glad you mentioned julius randall in that that comparison because I had on here that uh, reportedly he's doing well in controlled contact situations with the Knicks. Word, so all like, the wording yeah. is the same thing. Yeah. Is 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 basketball controlled contact? Mm, that's I mean, why he hasn't returned to play fully. And how much? How often have I said this? Basketball is not a non-contact sport. Basketball is a contact sport. Football is not a contact sport. Football is a collision sport. Right. I mean that's the the difference there. Uh, yeah, and you know, it's interesting that Jeff thought that people, and I like to hear it, felt a little bit of obligation to NIL, yeah, to play. I was like, hmm, I wouldn't have thought that. <laughs> I think it depends on the person, yeah, yeah, it depends on the situation. Uh, I, I don't know that, that I would have thought that, right? All right, what else we got here, Jacob? Uh, well, Taylor sent me a thing, uh, he wanted your expert opinion on that vasectomy surgeries increase at the end of March, uh, <laughs> end of the year and end of March is the, <laughs> wait, 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 not end of the I, March. I'm going to give March Taylor some grief here. Okay. <laughs> Boring ch- You had your, you're a journalist. You have a question for Jeff Goodman. Uh, who's your favorite? Who's going to win? Ter- I mean, Jacob didn't even get to answer one. I know. One. And number two, it sounded like he answered it a long time. And the best thing about a journalistic question, make sure they talk more than Yeah, the open-ended. So it sounded like I did okay. I'll defend him too. He didn't have headphones at all, so he didn't hear the whole Jeff Goodman. I didn't hear my answer at all. I was like, "It's good. It's going good." <laughs> well, Jacob took a pass. He ceded to you. And, uh, who's your favorite? Who's going to win the tournament? I was like, "Oh, jeez." I, I, like, I threw all my questions in the pod press. But, but my son <laughs> in fifth, my, my son in fifth grade would ask that question. Yeah. You couldn't ask a better one than that. That's why I was like, "Okay." I might, I might why did you ask the vasectomy question? Yeah, sure. There you go. Later, right. All right. <laughs> 
yeah, that's that's your expertise. Or I don't know if you can pull it up. <laughs> I have to find it. Last year, my son, if you remember, he filled out a bracket, and on the first day of March Madness, he was sick. Oh, that's right. And then the wife came home after dropping the his sister off. And he's on the couch with snacks and everything, TV ready to go <laughs> with his bracket yeah. thing right in his hand. I think he like, did a poll, like, what do I do? Send him back to school, ground him, or just let it ride? <laughs> and then I think or, everybody was like, let it ride. <laughs> or, or congratulate yeah, exactly. him was, was part of it. Pulled the and no, he didn't have a vasectomy. But <laughs> look, if you're going to time out a vasectomy, and the reason why th there is some truth to this, look, look do I think that, it's like 500 vasectomies or 500 percent <laughs> no like but if you're gonna have one and you see what's yeah, rolling up okay yeah. here's the key like uh masters it's great right. okay but it's on saturday and sunday and the tournament's on saturday and sunday but people would argue that thursday and friday are among the, the best days, days yeah. right yeah. especially yeah. with 16 games on yeah. and four channels so that thursday missing a work day you know, I just had surgery and you just scheduled it for Wednesday, <laughs> right? Uh, yeah. Kind of deal. So I, I think there is some mild truth just, to that. Just a two birds, one stone approach. I have a study from, uh, it's a little dated, 2018, but it says, show the most popular time to schedule a procedure is the end of March. There's 500,000 men do it per year and they schedule it. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, in March, yeah, that's March Madness. I get it, but March Madness goes into April. But the first days now, the correlation would be okay. There's a three thousand percent increase for vasectomies on Wednesday or Thursday morning right. of March Madness. That would be yeah. The, look, they're just as <laughs> look in general. You don't pick elective surgeries in the summertime, right? In general, if you have a choice because you want to go and do stuff, right? In general, you don't pick elective surgeries during the holidays, Thanksgiving, November, December, in general, okay? So that already starts to narrow it down. So my question is, 500,000 men in the United States do the procedure annually. So is March, so let's do the math. So 480,000, so 40,000 a month, roughly. Right. Is the March number 120,000 or is <laughs> the March number 50,000 and 60,000? <laughs> okay, yeah. right? I mean, I, I would expect the March number to naturally be 50 or 60,000 because no one wants to do it in July. Yeah. No one wants to do it in December unless you're someone who's like, ah, I get time off from work and, and I can do it then. But it's holidays. You don't want to do that. So I'm just curious of the breakdown there. Sounds, uh, sounds like we need to put out a, toll, a poll on your uh, Twitter X. Did you have a vasectomy? What month did you get it in? <laughs> Are you currently recovering watching March Madness? Let's see. <laughs> March, I would say the, the Wednesday or Thursday. Yeah. Right? That would yeah. be the magic number, yeah. right? That would be because <laughs> early March. Uh, what are you, you need doing? need Thursday, Friday recovery time. Yeah. Yes. yes. To yeah. miss Thursday, Friday is the right. recovery time. So yeah. let's see. My son hasn't done a bracket yet. I'm sure he will. I'll, we'll see if he remembers to do this again. I'll, <laughs> I'll report back. Uh, in terms He's got to come up with something new, right? You can't go go to the well same time every year. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. Uh, go to NFL real quick. Just uh, want to mention Leighton, Leighton Vanderesh officially announced his retirement today. Um, the lingering neck, sh neck issues that uh, have plagued him his whole career. So glad that well, he made it so long. Well, we talked about it coming out of Boise State that the neck was going to be his demise. The question is when. Remember, he played his whole career with the collar. He survived a first surgery, and usually the second surgery is the end. And when he needed it, we said, oh, this is probably the end. He's had a great career. Congrats to him. You know, I wasn't saying don't draft him. And I wasn't saying the Cowboys didn't know about his neck when they drafted him. I'm just saying it's a factor in the analysis and in the end, you'd say he was a good draft pick because yeah. he played very well for a number of years. But in the end, the neck was always the ticking time bomb. The good news is you should live a 100% normal life. It's just football and the collision sport that he's now ruled out of after his second, second surgery. Uh, Cowboys uh, linebacker. I know you might hate to lie, but the Cowboys linebackers, but this is the second one that had to end prematurely. Jalen's still running around practice squads a little bit, but yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, we were stronger on Jalen, and uh, yeah. but Leighton was just, this is always the neck issue, so congratulations to him.
Cowboys like taking risks in the, in the draft, so pays off sometimes, but sometimes doesn't. Yeah. Uh, potential tampering investigation into Kirk Cousins, Saquon Barkley. Uh, it's always amazing how many free agent deals are in place the first day that you're allowed to have free agent deals. But the tampering's legal. <laughs> You're able to tamper. Yeah. You just can't have direct contact with the player. Right. It's back to the my guy Jim Harbaugh or Bill Belichick. Stealing someone's signals are not illegal. Stealing the signals and banging on trash cans yeah. and electronic means the Houston you Astros yeah. is illegal. Second guys on second steal catcher signs all the time. It's not illegal. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you might get beamed and whatever, but it's not illegal. It's if you go, if indeed Michigan scouted other games and traveled to them, if indeed Bill Belichick filmed the uh, signals. It's not illegal if you just have a piece of paper and said the guy touched his head and it means yeah, this. Decoded and wrote it and yeah. decoded. That's not illegal. Uh, it's electronic. So uh, with this, I mean uh, – I guess I'm not sure what my point was here that I got <laughs> off on. It's not illegal to tamper. They're looking into how it's how it's for example, tampering, yeah. Atlanta Falcons personnel couldn't have spoken to Kirk Cousins himself. It had to be the agent. So I think what comes up in question is did the athletic trainer talk to him about his Achilles? Now I put something out on Twitter. Less than free agents, but all the time, not always, but not uncommonly. The GM would say, find out about so-and-so. Okay, I'm not dumb. Yeah. Okay, uh, one year there was a wide receiver that was rumored to be on the trade market. I made some calls, okay? <laughs> but I didn't call the player. Right. Right. I called his doctor, his athletic trainers. and So it is common to scout things out. Um, but the technicality is, in theory, if the athletic trainer called Kurt Cousins, that's not appropriate. Could the athletic trainer or the doctor call Kurt Cousins surgeon or therapist? The answer is yes. And would the therapist or surgeon tell him anything because of HIPAA? That's a different question. Right. Mm -hmm. Could, in theory, the therapist or doctor say that's treating Kurt, say, hey, I'm getting a phone call about you. Is it okay if I tell them about you? If they said yes, there's nothing inappropriate yeah. about that investigation. And so I've made those phone calls, and it wasn't in this exact non-tampering situation. Uh, and for for uh, the draft, obviously, you get them all at the combines. But, yeah, uh, it's normal to check things out because you want to be ready to pounce, right? Yeah. And uh, – but it's just a matter of the technicalities of how. Yeah, I just want to mention the big busy week for content on the website. Uh, sixscore.com is where you can go. Fantasy baseball, NCAA March Madness tournament. We'll be following all uh, X, Twitter, SIC score if you want all the latest info. NBA stuff still going and hot and heavy. I know you got some NBA injuries too. Yeah, Joel Embiid tracking that uh, recovery progress, of course. Right, uh, stuff on that. So yeah. He did have the surgery on February 6th, missed 21 games. They did say the same thing about Randall, non-contact. They don't know much. So about Randall, him. he's not yeah. back yet, yeah. right? What happened to, yeah, we're optimistic he's good to go. And we said, no, nah, we're kind of pessimistic there that he's uh, good to go. Um, the uh, the uh, Who's the PRP guy? Um, oh, Donovan, Donovan Mitchell. Donovan Mitchell, yeah. Donovan Mitchell. We got caught a little flack and said oh, he's getting PRP. He's going to be out for at least two weeks and this, that, the other, maybe, said, yeah. uh, maybe a month yeah. out. He came back early. But now he's back and out. Soreness. Yeah, yep. Yes. I mean, we don't know for sure. We're just saying that that's the likelihood, and that's why we don't delete or change tweets or or what have you. If we're wrong, we're wrong. Julius Randall still hasn't made it back. It's been over a month now. Uh, Joel Embiid. How, what was the surgery again, Dave? Um, the flat. February 6th. Oh, February 6th. Yeah. yeah. Didn't they say four weeks, maybe six? Yeah. We're at six right now. And then they're optimistic for late March. It seems like they're he's not ramping up quickly for an immediate return. So you're worried about the season. That's why we're kind of weak. We're We've back. I've said all along, he's more likely season than back in one month. Right. So we've already hit that, right? Because yeah. he's not back in There's one like month. Now, I'm not saying he's not going to be back in season, but 
yeah, he's got a chance for playoffs, but will he? I I, I think he's still 50-50 to return for playoffs right. for the start of playoffs yeah. at this point in time. Ben Simmons, I mean. Yeah, I got he's had a microscopic partial discectomy. I think uh, you're more in tune to decode those three words than we are, yeah. but he already had a back surgery, I believe it was two years ago at this point. So Is it the same level or different level? I don't know that 100%. The fact that it's not a fusion is good, but you look at the spin. Microscopic, really small. <laughs> Partial. <laughs> Partial, not full. This no fusion. Everything's the, all good. Discectomy is the scary word. <laughs> all the 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 words to make it pinch nerve in his lower back. Seem like it's nothing. Yeah. Second surgery, multitude of injuries. I think I don't know what his contractual situation is, but I think it's time. Almost 40 mil next, next year, yeah. and then they have an out. Jeez stuck in what you have i mean i think they're they're just trying to get out yeah. i mean uh, how they're going to get out is a different story i mean that career has been very unlucky that's the last year or so do they i mean i mean how, how many basketball players come back after two back surgeries so not a lot come for, back after one there's one um there's a player still playing um for the nuggets michael porter out of college you were yep. worried about him he had his second procedure a couple years ago missed a majority of the year he is back playing well over you know 15 points a game but if he has a third one, that could be in the cards. Well, it's not that simple, right? Is it same level, different level? Mm -hmm. Does it go on to fusion? So we don't have all the information, but everyone knows Ben Simmons has had a star-crossed injury history. Yeah. Uh, Beast of the Week, I don't know if we want to go. Braden Smith, uh, I know you, you had a consultation with Stephen Che. <laughs> his, uh, his AC joint that he had uh, wrestling around a bar stool. So. <laughs> Look, that Stephen Che injury... That was real, man. That was not a <laughs> WWE wrestling mat that he got slammed down onto. It was a wrestling mat, but not on, the bouncing the gym floor. The room is a yeah. in school, so. uh, I mean, <laughs> more than some of the other barstool injuries. That was a real injury <laughs> there for for my friend there. Uh, all good, and and uh, and well, I guess Barstool Big Cat put it out there. It wasn't me. Yeah. I mean, technically. Yeah, I, you didn't I didn't want to release chat it. with him, but it's not my <laughs> place to release. I mean, I can go off video and see what it is, yeah. but the fact that I chatted with him, that's not my place to release it, yeah. nor did I ask Stephen if I could release it. Right. And But I guess Barstool Bitcat did. Right. So, it's, 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 <laughs> so it is It is. Uh, yeah, it is what it is. Of course, he has a doctor on staff. You know, when he calls you on the, the <laughs> Yeah, it's all good. Um, baseball, uh, the other big injury is Garrett Cole, right? Yeah. I mean, look, read the tea leaves. Elbow, worry, worry. Early fatigue, worry, worry. MRI, no immediate report. This is no tears, no injury on right. MRI. And then actually flying across the country. I mean, now we're on the lucky to return to full form. Take it if you're a Yankee fan, if he returns after the All-Star break. That's not a bad result. Now they're on two months and then check back. Okay, two months. And then a six-week ramp up. Aren't we at the All-Star break? Yeah. I mean, not good for Garrett Cole Yankees, and obviously Aaron Judge still has some issues there. All right, um, we're still in that UFC injury was pretty grotesque. Jeez, oh, that one or the Florida kid that snapped his went to fib. So I think the I, UFC was worse. I'll, I'll say that here. Um, I'll say it here rather than I didn't want to do it on Twitter mm -hmm. fully. Those injuries are very gruesome. The USC guy, you can go look at it at Pro Football Doc or Sports Injury Central, SIC score, um, leg snaps, distal femur fracture, and the and the and the basketball kid, uh, a Paul George ish yeah. injury. Tip fib, yeah. fib. Paul George was on a stanchion. This would just broke. Right. Inside out injury of the skin, make sure there's no infection, the whole deal. But more often than not, these injuries have an underlying cause, underlying weakness in the bone for it to snap there. Think of it this way. And I'm not saying they've got cancer. Cases or just the, I know you said that about the UFC kid. Is that also for the Florida kid as well? Yes. Okay. Did he have a stress fracture brewing there? Mm -hmm. Did he have some benign growth from a child, like a knot in the tree trunk there? Okay. Same with the UFC guy. I mean, it's not typical to break like that there. Yeah. Now, I'm not suggesting it's the Dave Dravecki you right. Know, right. kind of thing Obviously, where it was yeah. a, a 
completely weakened, but mm -hmm. chances are good that there was an underlying stress fracture in the Florida kid. Chances are good there's something going on in that UFC guy to make it. A, it's just not a typical place to break. Yeah, I'm not saying they've got cancer or this, that, the other, but that's the typical as you look at it there because there's other areas of weakness. Okay, the bicycle chain always breaks at the weakest link. Mm -hmm. Why is that link weaker in this situation? You know, mm -hmm. why did it break there? That's all. Unless he had pain or anything, you're not doing an x-ray on his lower leg just to do no, it. Oh, and, and he may not have had any pain, yeah. right? And just not known about it uh, kind of thing. You may not have known about the little bit of weakness there. And that's why it breaks right there. I mean, if a table, table leg breaks off or a chair leg breaks off when someone sits in it, it's not that the table leg was or the chair leg was 100 percent it was it was weaker and then someone sits in it and then it breaks it's yeah. not you know okay maybe it's a bigger guy it's more force who knows or you, you flop down but usually there's an underlying weakness when that happens so he said when the mcgregor when he snapped there's he said he already had a little slight fracture there already so that's yes similar like similar yeah. type deal yeah. things usually make sense there all right jeff goodman was great uh who do you want for next week what do we got coming up? We'll uh, we'll start firing yeah, up texting. Might some be people. baseball, baseball time for baseball. Baseball, baseball somebody. Yeah. All right, I'll uh, we'll we'll get a baseball somebody. Uh, see if they want to come on here. Um, baseball somebody for next week maybe. And of course, there's a lot of football guys out there too. And and whatever sports. And uh, we'll use this off season for some fun. Thanks for watching and listening. Uh, thanks again to Jeff Goodman there. And uh, enjoy March Madness your vasectomy if you're having one <laughs> and uh, uh away we go uh follow us at uh, pro football doc sports injury central and give us a five-star thumbs up that would be appreciated we'll see you next week